a date which will live in infamy. On a thousand battlefields, our nation found its confidence and found its mission. It is the spirit of our soldiers and sailors and airmen and marines carried it to victory and sometimes carried into eternity. We owe them a debt. We repay it with a pledge to preserve their memory against the tide of time. five years after the war that their memorial was completed. Honor Flight was started by the Veterans Administration person in Springfield, Ohio. He was a physician's assistant and when he found out that the memorial was opened in 2004, he was like asking all of his patients, when are you going to go see the memorial? And they go, oh, we'd love to see it, you know, but we don't travel alone anymore and we don't have the money to do it. And, you know, I, I just don't know if my family could take me and all kinds of excuses like that. So he was a pilot and he had a small aircraft that he owned and he decided that he would take them one at a time. So by the time he took the first six, he would come back and his answering machine would be totally full. So he went back to uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where his flying club was and said, why don't we take them up in groups like 10 or 15 aircraft, which they did for a while. But then you have this, the usual problems with small airplanes. People couldn't get in and out of them. The weather wasn't good. Um, people's conflict of schedules and things like that. So he went commercial in uh, 2005 and decided that as much money as he could raise, he would just take them on a commercial airline. Uh, we were the fourth hub. By the middle of 2005, he already had 15 hubs. Other cities that were interested in helping him with this, this format, this program, was to get these veterans to their memorial. Now there's 104. We've taken over a thousand veterans, but the whole network has taken 69,000 to the memorial. The average age of a flight now out of Cincinnati is 87. And we have guys into their 90s, and eventually we're going to be moving into the Korean veterans. But our goal right now, our mission, is to take the World War II veterans, as many as we can, as fast as we can. Welcome to your honor flight. It is our great honor to take you on a chartered flight from Greater Cincinnati Airport. Your valor and your courage was rewarded by securing the freedoms for all Americans, the freedoms you won for all of us. Now we honor you with this trip to your memorial. It took over 60 years to build this memorial, and today you will see it for the first time. It's a long day, but it's a long time coming. I am joined here by the board members in the red shirts. I introduced them earlier. It's my privilege and honor to work with them to complete our mission. Through their tireless efforts, all of our expenses for taking the veterans has been donated. Every penny of the money raised for the Simply Money Foundation and others pays for the veterans' special trip to D.C. The Guardians, help by covering their own expenses on an honor flight, would like to especially thank them again. And to our treasured veterans, may this be the beginning of a wonderful day filled with many memories, and may you be blessed all the days of your life. You have given up us the freedoms we now enjoy, so please let us take care of you today is a small gesture from a grateful nation. I'm your 
your typical young man uh, <laughs> trying to stay out of trouble, trying to make a dollar. And then I decided to, to go to service. And see, it looked like it had a little better opportunities. I had had uh, some ROTC training and I was made uh, a platoon sergeant in basic training, and that was something of a laugh. But And then I was reassigned to a company. They just started this universal military training school, and I found this uh, UMT just a little bit like the babysitting. So I said, would you mind cutting some orders for me and ship me to Japan or somewhere? So they did, they got me into special detail and I went to Camp Stoneman where I was reassigned to, to uh, Sagamo Prison. I was stationed at Sagamo for, from uh, early part of 48, uh, then I, I was discharged in 53. When the, the North Koreans invaded South Korea, we all decided to go with, uh, we wanted to go to Korea. Uh, we got on one Japanese ship that crossed the uh, to uh, Korea, and we had that 20, about 20 miles, square miles of peninsula left there at Pusan to defend and to keep the North Koreans from coming all the way, <laughs> ride us back into the, uh, Japan. And then that's when they hit us real hard, and that's when I was wounded and made it back to a field hospital. They got a heavy mortar attack and we were bunched up a little more than we should have been, I suppose, because when that mortar round hit in the midst of us, the only one that uh, it didn't kill out of five was me. And I took shrapnel in the face and threw my mouth. <laughs> and of course, I guess that's because I always have my mouth open anyway. But, uh, and then it got me through my shoulder. And I guess that's why I was, I was still around with a field radio. Took the biggest part of the shrapnel. I never was a religious person, but I thought, huh, well, I sure don't have anything to lose by not by saying a little prayer. And when you're in a firefight, <laughs> saying a prayer like, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Seemed a little bit silly at the time, but I guess it worked because I'm still here. Happy day. First Lieutenant MAC, which is the Medical Service Corps, Medical Administrative Corps. I was a stamp collector. I was sorting stamps. I had the radio on, and I heard it at that time. I very well remember that moment when it was announced. 
went to basic training. Uh, from then, I, I basic training. I uh, went to surgical tech school at uh, Billings General in Indianapolis, Indiana. I was there for a good while, and then OCS opened up, uh, and I volunteered for that to be a battalion surgeon assistant, which was sitting up in the front lines with a footlocker, triaging, putting a Band-Aid on a guy saying, go back or you're, you go the other way. And the reason it opened up, they were losing too many docs, so they figured we were more expendable. However, I was lucky. They were having like pep rallies in the area to recruit nurses because they needed them so badly. And my parents didn't really want me to go because my brother was already overseas, you know, and I guess they didn't want to lose two kids. So um, it took a little while to convince them that maybe I ought to do this. And so they finally consented. And by the time I got in, the war was almost over, but and it, at least I feel like I contributed a little bit. I think it was a month that we were in like basic training for learning to um, march and know how to get in and out of the gas chamber without getting sick. And uh, then we mostly observed on the floors and followed doctors around as they visited the patients, you know, until we were assigned to another hospital. You really had sympathy for all of them because they had no families there with them, you know, Normally, when we were with patients here at home in the hospital, their family was there to comfort them and and uh, make sure they got the care they needed. But very few wives or family members were with the boys there in the hospital. So, and uh, they weren't able to leave because they were all paralyzed. So there was, you know, they had no option but to stay there. December the 7th, when it all happened, I went to town. They was lined up for maybe half a block of uh, farm boys, uh, grocery boys, what have you. Anything that uh, they were doing, they quit and went in for this. And uh, I tried uh, three different times, and the guy said, you're, you're too young. I was just 16. So a couple of days later, I went home and wrote my mother's name on the paper, took it back up there, and I went to another recruiter that didn't know me. And he took me. The job I had, this gun sergeant, as a 105 howitzer. It was just those five, six men and a truck driver. It was pulled by the truck, the gun was. We may ride two or three days, half a day, a day's time. And we had orders to sit out at a certain place. The whole company would stop. It'd be four guns. They would all stop. We set up guns shooting up in the air. Uh, we may be there two days, a day, an hour, but uh, that was it. I was shooting this shell over there, killing those people over there. I'd get my gun loaded up, get my boys all loaded up, and we'd take off again. Wherever they say stop, that's where we stopped and shot for like I say, one day, two days, half day, an hour, get back on the truck and go up another day or two. The worst moment I had was when, uh, oh, late 45, early 46, when they started coming up with these concentration camps. 
uh, cleaning them up. Uh, that, that, that was the worst part I ever had. Uh, uh, the people were in horrible shape. They were all Jewish, uh, Polish, uh, prisoners of war, uh, melted there, dehydrated, uh, nothing left of them, dying. Uh, we had to get them out put them in a truck, take them to the, where they were going to bury them. And uh, that was the worst part I ever had. Killing nobody, I didn't care about that. But uh, that was the worst part I ever had. One day he said, Ezra Roy, you're going home? I said, thank you. I was ready to go. I'd done my bit, I thought, and uh, I was ready to come home. I remember the news came that uh, Pearl Harbor had been attacked. I, I, that, that was very exciting. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. When the war started and the draft started, uh, those who had ch ch children born prior to, to Pearl Harbor were classified 3A. And they didn't, so they were not drafted. And they took all the 18-year-olds and the single men first. Even though I was married and had two little boys, and I had, well, I had another girl, I had three little children, but two of them were born before Pearl Harbor, which caused me to be drafted later. But it was, but it was a, a, a relief because I f was uncomfortable. And all my friends and, and guys I worked with, they were drafted, and uh, I, f I felt I had some guilt. But when I was drafted, that took that kept, gave me a great relief. And we were assigned to stay there and to help train the new 18-year-olds that were coming in. And the reason was that, that we were older. I was about 25 years old, and all the, the new draftees were 18. And so we were like the old man to them. And there, there was an adjustment for them from civilian life into the army when we had to teach them what this army is, what this man's army is all about. And that's the way I spent my career. I never dreamed when that was happening. <laughs> 65 years later, I would go on an honor flight to Washington and be treated with such honor. Never expected that. We go into the charter terminal uh, in DCA, uh, in Washington, and uh, invariably, not always, you can't plan this, but uh, one, this was a ship that had just come in from Italy uh, with all the guys and the women that were uh, headed to their home, their home port. And when they saw he was coming up through the, the jetway, they're like, oh man, these are vets. So the commanding officer let him come over, and you know, by the time they were all saluting, we were all in tears by the time we got to the bus.
said, I felt like Caesar taking <laughs> over Rome. <laughs> Well, I felt like a big dork because he was in front of me, and there really, so, we kind of had a gap. So there wasn't a whole lot of people in front of us, and there was like nobody behind us, and it was the two of us, and we came off, and there was just this barrage. All these military guys, men, women, all in uniforms, clapping, saluting. I was like, holy. I, and I'm like, I'm all tearful, and I can't find my camera, and I'm like a big dork. And he went on walking, and I was so proud, and I was like, oh my God. And they shook all of their hands, all of their oh, yeah. soldiers, and and they weren't just—I mean, they were clapping, cheering. That was by the time I finally got my camera out. I mean, it was it was phenomenal. And they had said that they had just flown in from Italy, and they were all catching yeah. their flights home. But out of respect for our World War II guys, they all came over, like you said, on their own accord, and it, it was amazing. <laughs> I'm glad I was behind him. I was pushing him in a chair, but I was sobbing. And as I'm sobbing through the line, the guys that are shaking hands with him are patting me on the back, telling me it'll be okay. And that, you know, calm, you know, just take a deep breath. And then one of the other guardians, when I got to the end of the line, he got a hold of me and gave me a big hug and said, you gotta quit crying. <laughs> that was a basket case. It was pretty rough, but it was phenomenal. Well, it was. A tearjerker to me, and uh, it's kind of kind of hard to explain, but it was really something. When we got up, we weren't expecting anything. And here's all these people standing at attention when we go past the saluters. And then after we get all past with some of them, they broke ranks and they came out and our, our names, on our name tag, had our first name, Big. You know, and they had guys walk up to me and thank you, Ralph. Never expected to be treated that way. Service, sir. Appreciate you coming out today. 
you? How you doing, sir? Thank you. Welcome to Memorial. Thank you. How you doing, sir? Welcome. What's really cool about the World War II Memorial is you get to go in it. It's not like looking at the um, Washington Memorial or the Lincoln. They're all very impressive, but this one actually you get in. And it, it, the, it, the whole history of the war just kind of envelops you. Oh, it was amazing to me. I mean, I had, I had no idea of what to expect. I didn't know what it was going to be like, but it was just breathtaking. You know, it's so huge, and every state represented, and uh, all those uh, wreaths, one on either side. And uh, like I said, I had no idea of what to expect when I got there, so it was just breathtaking. It's absolutely breathtaking. And, Beautiful. He served in the Pacific, so I got the picture of that and, you know, took him over to where Ohio, said Ohio, and um, they had our flag up on there and that kind of stuff. And then listen to that tour guide say that all those pillars are exactly 17 feet high. No one pillar is more important than the other. They're all equal parts of the United States. It's just the whole thing. Who thinks of details like that? And then you got to get the picture of Kilroy. You had to find Kilroy. And so we went and found Kilroy and joked about <coughs> that. And my favorite part of it was the gold stars. There was 4,048 stars, and each one represented 100 men that died. Almost a half a million people. What you did, it was worth the wait because it, it, it's oh, yeah. breathtaking. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely well deserved. I mean, well thought out, everything about it, and, it, and even down to every inscription, every thing. The whole memorial, everything about the memorial, from the ropes that tied the states together, the states all being the same height, the etchings, you know, the, from the presidents, and the sayings from different people in the D-Day and that, you know, and then it sloped down into the reflecting pool with the fountains and there was a fountain for each one of the states and you're sitting there looking at all that and thinking, who, who, who sat and thought all that out that perfectly? There's not a thing about that memorial that is not just perfect.
watching him experience all of this. You know, it's like that whole Private Ryan where they're walking uh -huh. behind their dad. So when we're doing the Korea thing and we're walking up and I'm watching him and looking at it and knowing this is what he lived, that was pretty amazing. And you appreciate it on a level of just seeing it, but when your dad is one of those people. My ultimate favorite thing that I've heard my entire life that people of my generation, people today still don't realize, and people even after September 11th, that I've heard and heard and lived by, and I repeat, is the, you know, at first I was a little disappointed because in World War II, there's all these really cool statements of all the things that people say, and there wasn't any really cool except the one, the one and only statement, and what is it, Dad? Freedom isn't free. He has said that, and I was like, oh my God, that's it. <laughs> that was my very favorite moment, yeah. That's <laughs> We go to Iwo Jima. That memorial is kind of special because Americans thought that was the World War II memorial. It's actually the Marine Memorial. So we tell them everything about that memorial that we can. We've had the gentleman that actually was in the picture that put the flag up. Uh, he was on a flight uh, this year, and he said, that's not the real picture. The other one, the flag was all tattered, and this was just a photo op, and they found this new flag and put it up. We go to the uh, new Air Force Memorial that was only opened in 2006. So it's up on a plateau looking over the Pentagon and everything. Um, the whole Washington uh, panorama is before us and it's very impressive. Huge gigantic aircraft going up there, silver, that the sun's shining, you've got your stainless steel and it's, it's just very uh, humbling uh, what the aircraft did. You, you can't describe the feeling that you have by going and watching these men and women look at something that, I mean, is, has shaped our entire country and given them the freedoms that they have and people don't realize. They don't realize how much work and what people did and how people died. They don't take anything for granted, nothing. They, they lived through the Depression as children and they went through the war and everything they have now they earned. No one gave them anything. They came back and they built our nation quietly. I mean, they just came home and wanted to be family people and family men and do their job. And they really weren't boastful or proud. A lot of them cry on these flights and they said, you know, we never had a parade, but we really never knew we wanted one. We were mostly interested in coming back to our sweethearts and starting our families and, and building the nation that we fought so hard for. But I don't think it was in their minds that they didn't have a parade or nobody really appreciated it. They knew we did, but nobody's ever outwardly appreciated them before. They didn't think they were heroes. When we, when we were discharged, there was nothing formal about that at all. You just, you're on your own, young fellow. Let's go. Here's your money. 
and we walk out and you say, well, you got to find a train, I guess, you know. And they never, at that time, never dreamed that 65 years later that I would be honored the way I am. On behalf of Honor Flight Tri-State, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country. We appreciate it. This is a small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. I had one heck of a nice time. I mean, it was a, an experience to say the least. I mean, it's one that we'll never forget. And anyone that's had any association with it will never forget it. You couldn't ask for any more. I mean, and uh, the way things was organized from one place to the other, it seemed to pick up a little momentum at each one. And the crew. I mean, you know, everything was meticulous. I mean, the lunch, the service, you could not want for anything. You couldn't ask for anything. People were falling all over themselves. There was a ton of them. It was nice. Yep. The only way it could be duplicated is if I get to go again. <laughs> there you go. It's definitely an honor flight. I just don't know how to tell you. I just thought it was wonderful, and I can't, to, even now, I can't believe that this happened to me. Why? Why? What, what did I do to deserve that? But it was wonderful. Just, and I hope that every soldier who's, or sailor or Marine or whatever who is still alive can have the experience of going. It will be some, something that I'll never forget. It's, it's just wonderful. They treat you like a general. The five-star general couldn't get treated any better. We say that it changes your life, and I believe it does. Uh, it connects you to the past in a way you've never been connected before because it's human beings. To me, the war was either a page in a history book or a black and white movie with Jimmy Stewart. And my own father wouldn't talk about the war, but it connected me to his generation and to him, even though he's passed, to what they accomplished and how little gratitude they got. And to me, to be able to, to honor them, literally honor them, uh, it's, it's very important to me. That's what's been a really huge part for me in Honor Flight is the fact that I finally get to say thank you, because I didn't do anything for my country before that. I was caught in the Vietnam era, you know, wife, married, kids, and I didn't get to do anything. I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it. I didn't walk with a picket sign and protest the war, but I didn't do anything positive either. And now is my chance to finally do something for my country. If I can make one of these, these women or gentlemen have a really perfect day, that's my service now. That's what I get to do. It was all organized. The, the honor flight was so well organized. That's what surprised, that, that impressed me. And when I, and when I <laughs> think, think back about it, and I do, uh, I think of, of, of the work that, was to, that it took to put that together. But I thought, think of all the little things that they had to manage. And, and, and how well they did it. The people behind the scenes that are doing this as volunteers have made it all possible. And I thank them for it. Since I've come back, I've told all the accolades I could. Uh, and I'm a salesman for them. <laughs> of course, my salary, I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid, nor does anyone else. 
and I make that well known that it's a, a volunteer outfit and it's wonderful. And I let people know it. It was, it was an honor, it was a treat, it was a privilege, and it was very well deserved. And the respect that they received from everybody involved was long overdue. Whenever I tell retail what we did, all day long, if everybody could have one day like what we had, people stopping. Thank you, sir. Thank you. They were jogging around the park. Come to a complete stop. Thank you, sir. You know, just one day like that. It's just something I think everybody should do. I know they said they're going to start doing some Korean War, and I hope. Anybody that's got one can take them. I just feel very grateful and I would feel very indebted to whomever paid for it because it was just an outstanding trip and something I will always remember. So I hope that Every veteran who is still able and alive will be able to get there before it's too late. So honored to have been given the chance to go on this honor flight and appreciate the things that have been done, There's all those memorials, to make it stop and think and appreciate who we are. <laughs>